Hello, my name is Dr. Hawthorne Smith. I am the director of the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture. And I would like to thank Dr. Nate Bertelson, the entire International Panel Physicians Association for inviting me to be with you today. Um, we're gonna to be talking about trauma-informed interviewing skills and particularly has that might help you as panel physicians and civil surgeons in assessing mental health issues with migrant populations. Um, we have a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna jump right on in. Um, first of all, I have nothing to disclose in relation to this presentation, which sometimes I feel a little, a little bittersweet about, but um, nothing to disclose thus far. And I am representing the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, where we have worked with um, survivors of human rights abuses, torture um, for the last quarter century. And one of the things, and I, I show some of these images that come from the IRCT here, is that we are dealing with physical scars, the actual physical manifestations of, 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 of abuse, as well as the emotional scars of torture. And um, as you will be engaging in the, the this sort of assessment of, of migrants coming into the country and everything, a lot of the impact that we hear from our clients. They, they will tell you that the physical scars may heal over time, but oftentimes the scars that are most pernicious and the ones that are longest lasting are the emotional scars. And what we wanna do today, one of the things I really wanna put forth to you is to no longer separate these things out as different fields of inquiry, but that actually the emotional impact the, the context in which the migrants you will be assessing are passing through is extraordinarily important to understand their entire status of health. It impacts on the physical and it goes beyond the physical as well. So when we look at severe trauma as we do here, and I understand that not everyone you will be assessing may be a torture survivor, but the, the things to understand is that people who are usually being uprooted, moving from one country to another, there are stressors behind it. And it is really important to understand that when someone is traumatized, the areas in which the impact can hit them do not operate in silos. They are not distinct. They are overlapping. And I look at this slide that we created, um, and I know that if I had better PowerPoint skills, this flower could have many more lobes. But for now, even looking at the cognitive, the behavioral, the spiritual, physical, emotional, all the different ways one is impacted, I want you to look at the center of this flower, where all of these things tend to overlap, because again, nothing operates in a vacuum. You know, we may see, you may see some of the physical ramifications linked to traumatic experience. Um, there might be somatic complaints linked to one's emotional state. Um, we may see people who are dealing with issues of pain, issues of emotional dislocation, what have you, that are impacting their behaviors. Perhaps people who have never drunk before or smoked before or instances of um, intimate partner violence within the household, things like that that might be going wrong that are part of one's state of health. And one of the things we look at, and again, if we had more time, I would plunge into all of these different areas, but we see that, you know, again, all of these domains overlap. None of this happens in a vacuum. And the bad news is that there are so many ways that migrants, that survivors of torture and human rights abuses are impacted by the trauma. But the good news is that there are so many different ways to intervene. There are so many different ways to provide tangible services. And what you are providing, um, not only in terms of the health issues involved in your assessment, but also the fact that your assessment serves as a key for someone maybe to be walking into a new future or what have you, which can have impact on their emotional or spiritual um, feelings in the moment. All of this overlaps. And if you ever come to our program and you see the medical doctors, you see the psychologists like myself, oftentimes the longest line we have is outside of our legal services um, office where people are saying, what can I do to bring my family here? How do we adjudicate the asylum process? All of these things are going on 
and impacting our clients, but then there are also ways in which we can intervene. So again, I wanna just proactively thank you for everything that you're doing and the services that you were providing. So assessment, the nuts and bolts of what you will be engaging in. I, I, I did a training not too long ago, actually, I guess back in um, 2018 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, through the Allegheny Health Network. And um, there was a, a primary care doc who was talking about assessment at that point. And one of the things he said that really stuck with me is that we need to go beyond a review of symptoms, of, excuse me, a review of systems. What would Freud say about that? Um, that beyond just the functioning of various aspects of one's physical health, we need to review one's experiences. We need to look at the context in which they are coming to us, in which they are existing, and review of the feelings that we have about this. I mean, even if we just look at what we have been going through the last 15 to 18 months with the COVID pandemic and the incredible weight that that has thrown upon our, our medical system. We find that we are not just dealing with people who are infected. We are dealing with people, we are dealing with populations who have been affected. Beyond just the mortality rates from COVID or COVID related diagnoses or people who were not able to receive medical treatment, et cetera, we have seen significant surges in terms of suicidal behavior, in terms of substance abuse, in terms of intimate partner violence, in terms of depression, in terms of ang anxious feelings and people dropping out of school and doing what have you, all people impacted by this pandemic. Again, if we just stick to a review of systems and what's going on in one's body, we may miss a significant part of what is going on with them in terms of a holistic sense of their health functioning. So really focusing in, in, in a way to make things interdisciplinary so that we do not, again, see that behavioral health is over in that section somewhere and that physical health is here and one's immigration status is over there. All of these things, the emotional functioning, the physical functioning are part of one's overall health. So what are some ways to get at that? How do we begin to sort of integrate some of these other questions and assessments into what used to be a, a review of systems? The founder of our program, Dr. Alan Keller, um, you know, he says sometimes if he, as a primary care physician, when he's doing an assessment, he said if he could only ask one question that sort of bridges that gap between the physical and the emotional is that he would ask the client, how are you sleeping? Because sometimes the insomnia symptoms or trauma-related nightmares or truncated sleep or not being able to sleep at night, but only being able to nap during the day, all sorts of things that might help to guide you in terms of follow-up questions. Um, and to, to normalize this conversation that is not like, okay, we are done with the medical assessment. Now here's this other stuff, you know, here's another questionnaire I can give you as though it's a, an adjunctive piece. It really is integral. And when one of our clients speaks to us when someone that you were assessing speaks to you and talks about their level of pain or distress. Um, as we are all trained, we know that the best determinant of someone's level of pain or distress is what they relate to us and what they express to us and what we can do in terms of normalizing the fact that we're having this conversation is someone who might be tearful in front of us or report some of the contextual challenges, et cetera, that this is actually part of the health assessment, that we do not stigmatize somebody that is having emotional challenges. And we certainly don't minimize them or minimize anything that falls outside of our domain of expertise. This is part of gathering this information that will really serve as um, the holistic assessment for our clients. Um, you know, and as we talk about these things, we, you know, we, we try not to label clients, but at the same time, there are others 
who really feel that finally something that they've been going through has a name. So again, there are a lot of ways that we can really help to support our clients here. So one of the things that we talk about quite often um, in terms of migrant populations where there may be survivors of torture, other human rights abuses or what have you, is, the, is around post-traumatic stress. And, you know, the DSM-5, you know, has broadened um, the population that might be um, really appropriate to consider in terms of PTSD, not just the people who have been directly exposed or directly wounded, uh, but people who have witnessed trauma, um, been exposed to death, threatened death, threatened sexual violence and all of that, or perhaps learning that a relative or close friend was exposed to a trauma. So this indirect exposure sort of broadens the capacity for people, not only in terms of how we categorize them, but really in terms of how we can engage with people in terms of who really is on the sort of front lines in terms of, of, of trauma. And the instance of trauma in the population is broad, particularly as we come out of, um, or beginning to come out of this era of COVID, where again, I, I cannot think of anybody um, in my life, professional or private, that has not been affected by this pandemic, um, even beyond those who have been infected. Um, so again, these PTSD symptoms and clusters, and I won't spend a great deal of time on this because you're going to be seeing a wide range of presenting styles, but at least in terms of what we see here at the program, um, beyond PTSD, issues of anxiety, issues of um, depression or what have you are seen very frequently within the migrant populations. And again, it might not even be something that follows the exact parameters of PTSD. Um, one of our psychiatrists here, Dr. Asher Alajan speaks and says, you know, we do not treat diagnoses here. We treat people who have a particular constellation of stressors, um, strengths, and who exists within a context and how do we sort of design this for them. When we look at these PTSD symptom clusters, we do not see anything in terms of survivor guilt, for example. You may be doing um, an assessment of a client who is coming into this country but feeling extraordinarily guilty that they were the ones who were able to escape or coming here while loved ones um, or family members are still back at home and perhaps in harm's way doesn't fit diagnostically, but we still need to have our eyes and ears open to that um, so that we're able to respond in, in a positive way. But trauma affects us in so many ways. We've already seen the ways that it, 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 it hits us emotionally, cognitively, um, you know, hits our memory, all different sorts of ways, but ways that it might manifest itself when someone is talking with you when you are assessing someone that their ability to process information you know we talk about how in a life or death situation being really on edge having your nerves really um you know stressed out and and, and on edge may actually be adaptive at times if you hear some noise out in the front of your building and you're able to sneak out the back window because you were so hyper vigilant might save your life but what happens to someone when they are out of that situation of danger, but their nerves are still on edge like that? It may manifest itself when they're less capable of taking in new information, forgetting dates and appointments, showing up late, etc. It can impact their ability to talk about their memories, even as you're beginning to assess them. It will have impact on how they relate to other people, including you, and how things might... Um, you know, really go forth within your assessment. What do they think about the future? Can they even think about the future or are they foreclosed on that? What do they feel about the world? I've been dealing with some adolescents now who are having a really hard time in sort of this, I don't wanna say post COVID, but sort of getting towards post COVID, but they're like, this world is so incredibly, <laughs> why should I engage? Motivation being gone and a person's feelings about him or herself. So these are aspects of one's interpersonal engagement that may manifest itself. And one of the things that we wanna really, really talk about is that 
observational data is very important within your assessment. I mean, we can fill out the post-traumatic checklist five, the PCL five, we can do other measures like PHQ for depression, all those different things. What someone reports to us is very important. But what we observe, again, someone, you know, are they able to think in a very sort of longitudinal and do they give their history in a very sort of linear fashion or do they think tangentially? You know, um, are, are they avoidant in terms of talking about certain things? Are they sort of more fixated on other things? Did they show up late? Did they get lost on the way to your appointment? Have you had to reschedule? Things that we can observe, that we can put in that are, um, I think, very illustrative uh, in terms of the assessment we will do. We find here that we have to do many um, affidavits for asylum hearings, et cetera. Not only what the client reports, but what we observe clinically is very important in terms of presenting a full picture of what's going on. So beyond what's going on at the individual level, when, again, when we sort of see someone in um, a situation where they may feel marginalized. And again, these are things that you may be able to pick up on in terms of your assessment, where we see clients who perhaps they were, they had advanced degrees um, in their home country, um, or they were going through schooling, but now coming here, perhaps now they're pushed back in school or their degrees are not recognized. Or in the case of a 17 year old girl who's been in a refugee camp for the last three or four years, where do we place her? Do we place her with the age appropriate 17 year old class, and maybe juniors in high school where she's almost bound to fail because she has missed out on school the last few years? Or do we plug her in with her academic level where developmentally she's three or four years older than those people? There are many spheres of marginalization. Clients who, um, are hesitant to take logistical or financial assistance because they used to be the heads of their extended families. Um, they feel that it's, it, there's shame in accepting charity. What about those people who are now faced with the asylum process and all the ups and downs that go with that, who have never set foot inside a courtroom before? The vocational and professional devaluation um, where we our, our clients teach us, you never know who's driving your taxi. You never know who's sweeping your floor. Many times you will be dealing with and we deal with people who were targeted because of their leadership capacity and their leadership position back in their home country. And various ways that people are marginalized socially. All of this is again, part of that context that with open-ended questions, with the fact that, hey, how are things going and assessing some of these contextual issues really will shed more light in terms of one's overarching health functioning than just limiting ourselves to the physical review of systems. So I mentioned before that there's so many ways that clients are challenged and that's the bad news, but there's so many ways that we can engage. Um, you see the lobe there with medical treatment, the fact that you may catch something um, that is extraordinarily problematic for them. Might be pain issues that you help to alleviate or perhaps something that they weren't feeling but was very deadly to them. Um, and the fact that they engage with you and that you are able to provide some of these services and also perhaps provide referrals as you understand that they might need some support in terms of emotional relief. They might need some support as they're dealing with isolation. You know, so they might need help in terms of community connection, legal support, et cetera. You become very credible when you are able to provide concrete services, which opens the door to them perhaps being open to other concrete services that they might not have considered before and or perhaps were stigmatized, like behavioral health can be stigmatized. So, you know, in terms of making an effective referral, if you are working with someone and you're seeing like, wow, they, they, they really are struggling. Um, you know, one of the things you can do is the focus, not just on, you know, this sort of a, a general life um, narrative, but what has changed recently 
in terms of cognitions, emotions, physical functioning, etc., um, that might be linked to a particular trauma or a particular event or something. Um, because when we talk about these changes and you're able to put it forth like that, it will also help to target your referral in a way that can be more effective um, to those to whom you are referring. Approaching things in a collaborative manner, we're going to speak more on that in a minute, that it's not just, hmm, here's what you presented to me, here's what you should do, but to engage with the client in terms of, you know, this really seems like this is something that is a high priority for you, that is troubling. Let's think for a minute about potential resources that might be out there. So another important aspect is to really approach things in a collaborative manner so we are not sort of dictating, okay, here's what you said, well, here's what you should do. Um, that we engage with our clients to say, hey, here's something that seems to be a high priority for you. Here's something that's troubling. Let's see if we can problem solve about finding resources, about finding a way where you can get the assistance that you merit for what's going on. Um, and with that, we explain the rationale behind the referral, not just like, oh, you're, you're, you're sick and you need to go see a shrink or something like that. I know none of you would say something like that. But if we are able to explain things in a way that normalizes, that helps to empower the person that they are moving forward with their own health improvement activities um, and really couch it in terms of utilizing resources. And we don't want to overwhelm folks with too much information because then it just sort of goes away and there's not as much real engagement. So after we have talked about referrals, maybe walking through um, thing with the person to make sure you know there's some cognitive planning going on um i don't know how far downstream you will have contact with these folks or if there's anyone in your organization with whom a case manager or what have you but to provide support um to try to make sure that folks actually do follow through on these issues and if you do end up in a situation where this is you know beyond the assessments you're doing but part of your ongoing treatment modality with perhaps other clients you know, letting the patient know that you will be following up with them and that you will, you know, hey, when we next meet, let me know how it went with blah, 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 blah. That may really help them to follow through and make the most use of what you were doing. Okay. So in terms of the healing journey, a couple of things I just want to throw out there. A couple of the really important, um, I, I, I would say, treatment priorities and techniques are really about safety and empowerment particularly as you will be among some of the first people dealing with the migrants um, you're dealing with and it. It's, 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 um, it can be a, an angst provoking situation. Will I be accepted? Do I go into this country? What will the doctor say? So anything that you can do, I think in terms of anticipatory guidance, helping to explain what your processes will look like and really engaging that sense of, you know, the power of an empathic human relationship one of my old supervisors used to say that as a psychologist, I never walk into the room with Freud or Adler. The lawyers don't walk in with Clarence Darrow. We walk in with ourselves as empathic, caring human beings. And that human relationship is really where the healing process starts. You know, helping to empower our clients who have been oftentimes violently, um, purposely disempowered so that they find their voice in what is a very challenging situation is, is something that is, is very important. And even though we are not asking you to engage in ongoing therapy or what have you, understand that what you are providing these clients is therapeutic. It doesn't have to be therapy to be therapeutic. Your support, your understanding, your way of in integrating emotional and physical health um, together within a context is amazing. A couple other things I'll add here. There's the incredible gift of trust. One of the things you will be challenged to do is to build a trusting relationship with the client. And at the very beginning of my process here at Program for Survivors of Torture, I met a woman from a Central African country who explained to me very clearly that there was nothing I could do to earn her trust. She had been a member of an elite family. When there was a coup d'etat, the bodyguards who were charged with protecting her for the time she was a little girl were the first people to turn on her. So she said, you know, you could say the right things. 
you could do all the right things for 20 years because that's what my bodyguards did. But they eventually betrayed me. So there was no way you can earn my trust. I responded with silence because literally I, I had nothing. <laughs> but she continued and she said, but you know what? Even though you cannot earn my trust, perhaps it's something I can offer because I really need your assistance. And with that, I've always since then understood trust to be this incredible, precious gift. We can't earn it, but we can destroy it. So anyway, I hope that that's something you will keep in mind. And last on this slide, I'll talk about character versus circumstances. That when you are meeting with migrants, and many of the migrants you meet with may be forced migrants or survivors of human rights abuses, their circumstances are extraordinarily difficult. And sometimes clients will come to me and say, hey, Dr. Smith, I don't even recognize myself when I look in the mirror. I gained so much weight. I've lost so much weight. I would never wear clothes like that. I used to be the responsible person of an extended family, and now I'm the 14th person sitting in a one-bedroom apartment. Those are circumstances. But oftentimes we work with the person to help them to understand that if they were a socially oriented, generous, intelligent person back in their home country, they remain an intelligent person. They can recapture their ability to be socially oriented. They will perhaps be in a position where they can be generous to other people in the future. The more we hold on to our character, the better we can navigate these really turbulent circumstances. And we never make the, pro the promise that, oh, things will return how they were. We can't make that promise, but we can talk about new circumstances or developing, evolving circumstances and how will we be best placed to really engage in that. But what about us? You will be meeting folks with a plethora of challenges we work with traumatized people all the time. How do we take care of ourselves? And I, I, I love this picture. This is a picture I took in, um, in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. I was going to a conference to talk about issues of self-care and provider wellness. And I was wondering if only there was an, an image to, to, to sort of speak to what happens if we don't take care of ourselves um, and we're unable to move forward. And I saw this rescue boat rotted out rusted, you put this boat in the water, it's gonna go straight down. It cannot rescue anybody. We cannot rescue, we cannot heal, we cannot help anybody if we don't take care of ourselves, provider wellness. So what do we do as healers who are subjected to or immersed into so much human suffering? And this is a, a much longer conversation, but a couple things I just wanted to mention you know, it's one about setting realistic goals for ourselves. When I first came into this field, I was told that not only could I not save everybody, but I couldn't save anybody. All I could do was to help to put someone in the context where they can work to save themselves. And you are very much at that crossroads where people are coming to start a new life. And perhaps with the way you're able to integrate this holistic sense of health and hope for them, it will help them to move forward. And another thing I do, and you see me here, I'm playing sax. One of the things I do is to play music, to find some way to process, to sublimate all the trauma, all the sad stories, all the suffering that we take in and try to transform it into something that is beautiful and something that is, that is uh, creative. We don't want to be like that proverbial sponge that is saturated and can't take any more in. We don't want to be like that boat. And then people sometimes ask me, you know, you're Dr. Smith, you're involved with PSOT, you're now in the president of a consortium, you play in a band, you're raising, like, where do you find the time? And the question is, you really can't find the time. But we can make the time. And, you know, I, that sounds like small semantics, but Honestly, what I want to say is that, you know, there are times where at the end of the week, I feel that Bellevue has won. I am done. The last thing I want to do, you know, or the, all I want to do is pick up my remote control, sit down on my couch and watch TV. But I know I have a gig that night or a rehearsal. And I'm like, the last thing in the world I want to do is go play music now. But invariably, when I go out, I meet my friends, I start to play. I realize that's exactly where I need to be. It's almost counterintuitive. 
but we need to find a way, again, this is perhaps a longer conversation to make sure that we are engaging in activities that help to promote provider wellness so we can be there for our clients. And the very last slide I wanna share with you, and again, I wanna thank you for your time, is you know, learning from the people that we meet. They are the true experts. And you know, an example of that in something that has really um, sparked a new way of looking at the world for me is a, a group session we had. I, I, I run a group for French speaking African survivors. And about 20 years ago, we had a session where someone, an escaped slave from Mauritania who was really struggling and asked the question, what are the qualities needed to change the world or at least to survive in the world? And I really thought it was such a profound question that they would never come to a consensus, but I was wrong as I frequently am. And the group members that night came up with three things. They said, in order to change the world or survive the world, you need la sagesse, le courage, et l'espoir, wisdom, courage, and hope. And they went further and they explained that if you have two of these three qualities, no matter which two, it's insufficient. Because if you are a courageous and hopeful person, but you lack wisdom, chances are you'll go about your activities in a way that's, that's ineffective and you'll fail. Conversely, if you're wise and hopeful, but you lack courage, you will probably never act on the things that mean a lot to you. You'll be stuck in a prison of inertia. But the clients we work with, the patients that you will be assessing, the wisdom is there. And we're not even just talking about advanced studies or what have you. We're talking about sort of a, a, a moral education. My French clients want education de base, cultural education. The courage with what our people have lived through in their home countries and to be willing to pick up and come here and start over at zero, particularly here in New York City with all of our infamous warmth and fuzziness. We don't even have to talk about courage. But what's hard to hold on to for our clients is hope. But they went further and they said that hope is not so much something you have, it's something you do. It is a comportment, it's an attitude, it's a way of engaging and leaning into a world that is trying to break your humanity. It is very much an active uh, capacity to hope. And perhaps most importantly, this active capacity to hope is something that can be shared. And once it's shared, then our clients can use the wisdom and courage that they already possess. It's something that kind of blew my mind at the time and is really something that has changed how I view our work. And I see our work as being, we're in the business of helping people to share, to engage in their own capacity to hope so that they can use the wisdom and courage. And again, I just wanna thank you for what you're doing at that incredible crossroads. It's making a huge difference for the individuals you treat and their families and subsequent generations. It's important. I want you to know that we value what you do. I want you to value it. And I want you to take good care of yourself as you go through and continue to do this work. To all of you at IPPA, I salute you, I thank you, and have a wonderful day.